Welcome to the Who's Counting podcast with Cleta Mitchell, the podcast about America's elections. Welcome to this episode of Who's Counting with Cleta Mitchell. This is a podcast about all things having to do with elections, how elections are supposed to be run, how sometimes they're not run the way they're supposed to be, and what we as citizens can do about it. And so today, we're very blessed to have uh, as our guest on this episode, Dave Carver from New Jersey. So welcome, Dave. Thank, Thank you for joining you. us. My pleasure. So, Dave, I want you to um, tell everybody about yourself a bit. Um, I met Dave on our national working group calls that we do weekly talking about how we as citizens can get involved in helping to clean the voter rolls. And Dave made such an amazing impression on everyone when he started talking about what they've been doing in New Jersey that I thought, it would really be great for the podcast audience to be introduced to Dave and to hear his story and to hear what he and his team are doing uh, as citizen and volunteers in the state of New Jersey. So, Dave, thank you so much for being with us. And tell us, tell everybody a little bit about your background and how you became involved in election integrity. Uh, sure. Thanks. I'm from New Jersey, born and raised here outside Philadelphia. Went down to Tennessee to go to school for undergraduate work. Met my wife there. Came back to New Jersey and spent the next 30 years working my way up from an entry level to an executive level in a pharmaceutical business. I lived not only in New Jersey, but I lived in Switzerland for a while and in Australia for a while. So I had a chance to get out and see the world for a couple of years. Well, I keep coming back to New Jersey for some strange reason. I can't figure that one out. Uh, but that's what I did. Uh, but along the way, I said my, my volunteering, which kind of led me to this, is I volunteered to be a youth softball coach in my town. And after a couple of years, they asked me to take a bigger role, and I ended up running that program. Oh, and when that's a volunteer. Yeah, that's a volunteer. Yeah, just, you know, in my spare time, because I had nothing else to do in my spare time. <laughs> is the, the joke, my wife, we have no children. And I was allowed to adopt a team every spring. I just couldn't bring any of them home. And that worked well. <laughs> Because over the years, I've coached hundreds of kids. I would say I coached a former a young lady who grew up and won an Academy Award a couple of years later. Oh, wow. So you never know who a young lady is going to grow up and become as an adult. But I got kind of, as you run a program, you get to know the people who run your town. And there was a lady who was a councilwoman who was going to run for mayor. And she actually asked me if I would help. And I had no idea what I was getting into. And I said, sure, why not? We need new fields for my softball program. If you will help us as mayor get those new fields, I'm glad to help you. Kind of very, you know, very uh, clear. And I did help her and I did get my new fields ultimately, which worked out really well. But she asked me to run the voter challenge program for her. And we have 14 districts in my town and she wanted to keep track. It was kind of like not only checking the integrity of the voters who showed up, but understanding who didn't vote. So you call them at the end of the day and say, please vote. So I managed to get volunteers to cover 14 districts from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. on election day. And I put all the voter lists in. I had never done any of this before, but that was my first exposure to voter lists, what they look like. And I got the voter list together and I made sure all our volunteers had their districts and they knew what we expected of them. And we collected them all at six o'clock and a bunch of volunteers made a bunch of phone calls that night she won by 72 votes. Oh, wow. The power. Every vote counts. <laughs> Every vote counts, especially at the local level, which is really, you know, we always worry about what's going on in Washington. What happens in your local community is so much more important in yes. your life and how things operate. But that was kind of my first exposure. This was back in 2008. And I, by nature, I, in my job in big pharma, I manage huge regulated business processes and databases as head of U.S. sales operations and ultimately global marketing operations. Oh, wow. Everything, everything we did was very heavily rate. We had to do it right. So my team and I were all about getting the data right, you know, and double checking ourselves and self-auditing because you're allowed to make mistakes. It's what you do next that defines success. So I kind of looked at those first voter lists that first year and said, well, I know my town really well. This is a bit of a mess. But what do I do, right? And but as she became mayor, I stayed in touch with her and helped local people run for council. 
And I started getting the voter list every year. So I started to become really familiar with him. We have a small university in our town. And I was watching year after year as people that probably graduated a decade earlier were still on the voter lists. And it really, in a small town of 10,000 voters, 500 non-existent voters who are still on the list makes a difference. It kind of skews the data, skews the numbers, and it also leaves room for problems because all those voters are just sitting out there. But for a decade, I worked with our local list and kind of really got to know it well. And in, 20, in 2000, I'm sorry, in 20, what am I saying, 2016, when we had the first presidential election, I got involved a little bit more at a higher level at the county. And in 2020, when everything basically went vote by mail, is they asked me if I could help watch. And then I got really involved going from my community to my county, from 12,000 voters to 400,000 voters and to a total you know, mail-in election, which then it started to get very interesting because you just watch the volume of stuff moving out the door. We were getting files of every ballot that went out the door and we were getting bat- uh, files every day of who was returning their ballots, which was helpful because we could go forth and identify who had and remind them how important it was to vote. But during that process, I started to see a lot of the holes and the problems with the data, things going to places where people weren't there. We knew they weren't there. We knew they were inactive, confirmed voters, and stuff was still moving out the door. When so, Dave, really- let, let me ask you something about that. Yes. When Is this a automatic sending of a ballot or a yeah. ballot application to everyone on the voter list? Yeah, in 2020, when everything was kind of chaos, New Jersey made the decision to go 100% vote by mail. And they just shipped vote by mail ballots to the state. And New Jersey has 6.5 million voters on our rolls, Mm -hmm. of which pretty consistently, since we've been tracking closely in the last two years, half a million are inactive confirmed. It's a really fascinating thing they've done with the voter rolls in America. I say in New Jersey, you're either a voter, an active voter, or you used to be an active voter. They know you're not really there anymore, but they just call you inactive confirmed and leave you on the rolls, or you're going to be a voter soon. And New Jersey, we allow 17-year-olds to register, which is great because when they turn 18, they automatically become active. They don't have to worry about that 21-day waiting period because everybody else in New Jersey, when you register, there's a 21-day waiting period until you become active. So you're either active, you're fixing to be active, as they say, 17 or 21 days away, or you're kind of active, (laughs) even though we know you're not really there anymore. Kind of like all those voters at the local university in my town that just sit on the rolls forever. So that's how I kind of got involved from a very small, humble beginning to ratcheting up to being involved in the county. And in the last two years, meeting a group of like-minded people and going from the county to the entire state. And in every 30 days, we get a feed from the state of every single voter in the state. And we've been watching and counting and tracking now for coming up on two years. So Dave, what uh, tell us about, because uh, every state is different, yeah. tell us what, um, what data do you get from the state or do you have to get it individually from the separate counties or can you get it from the state? Federal law requires states, the Help America Vote Act that was enacted after the 2000 presidential election requires all states to maintain a statewide a list of the voters, a statewide voter registration database. So do you get that data directly from the state or do you get it from the individual counties? We started going to the counties, but we soon changed our process. And right now, the last Friday of the month, so probably sometime later today, we are Oprah just sends the automatic reminder saying, hey, dear New Jersey, send us the voter list. And they send us the entire state voter list from Trenton, from our central board of elections staff. And we basically drop 6.5 million records into an SQL database. We also get an update every 30 days of the voter history, which is a file with voter ID and every election going back, I think to 2008, if I remember correctly, maybe I think it's 2008. And if they voted, how they voted, a machine vote, a vote by mail or a provisional. So every 30 days, the end of the month, 
we get that file from the state of New Jersey. So every week you get the voter file, the registration file. Every month, once a month. Oh, every month. Every month. So, last, so last you'll, the last Friday of each month. Yeah. Okay. And then you and you also get the uh, the voter history file. Right. Yep. Those are two separate files, right? Two separate, two separate files. Think of the voter list as you know as a giant Excel spreadsheet with your name, your address, the date you registered, your party, and your date of birth, your voter ID, and then your uh, geographical assignment, your county, your municipality, your ward, and your district, which is how New Jersey is organized. Mm-hmm. Pretty much, boom, just pretty much straightforward set of data for each individual. The voter history then, the connection is that unique voter ID number. Then that's a list of voter ID number and one or X as many elections as you voted in the past and how you voted. Those are not, the two not who you voted for, but the manner right. that in which you yeah, chose man- to vote. Yeah, it's none of our business who you vote for. Right. right? It's just we don't how care. You cho- yeah, we don't care. It doesn't matter. And what's, what's interesting now, the one place is it kind of lacks is it tells us you voted by mail, you voted provisionally, but it doesn't tell us the status of that transaction. Uh-huh. Was it accepted or was it rejected? And if it was rejected, why? So that one we've discovered, the county is really managing at the county level. They ultimately pass the results of the transaction kind of to the state for the voter history, but they don't tell them that, or at least we're not getting that. So when we get from the county level following an election, we'll say, may we have all the provisional votes for election X and the result? Because that result then we marry or we match up versus what the state is saying that just was a provisional ballot. We do the same thing for vote by mail, but we have found the state does maintain a one single source of all the vote by mail results for election. So as we are leading up to an election, we now get this. I get it almost every day because I run a report for people that says, here's the everybody who has requested to vote by mail. And in New Jersey, it's about 925, 930,000 people have chosen to vote by mail. So it basically has all their names in there. It says, when did they make the application? It says, when did they mail them their ballot? And then when they send it back, when it was received? And then at a certain point, how it was adjudicated, accepted or rejected and why. So we now get the vote by mail results from the state in this one single, one Oprah, submit one Oprah and get that file regularly during the whole election process. And then county by county, we get provisional. So we're still kind of piecing together a couple of different things, but ultimately we get everything from the source. Well, we found the most valuable way to manage and provide feedback to the state about the quality of their data is to give them their own data back and say, does this make sense? Okay, before we go to that, let me ask you something. So does New Jersey have uh, what you're saying is if some somebody can send in a notice or request to be put on, is it a permanent vote by mail list or does it have to be renewed? Um, every election cycle, or how does that work? It's actually the voter's choice. They can say, yeah, I'm just out of town this time. So they send in and they send in an application. It's an online application. It says, I would like to vote by mail now, or I would like to vote by mail forever. And that transaction is recorded. It's connected to the voter ID. And mm-hmm. it tells us if it's a one-time shot, which then gets cleaned off following the election, they would have to do it again the subsequent year or if they have made that choice forever. It, it also includes people like all of our, our federal only or our military folks who may be stationed out of the state or out of the country, or people who are maybe living permanently or temporarily overseas. They all tend to be on this list because they can't walk into a local uh, precinct and vote. So they're all on here also. And so do you still have uh, polling places where people can vote in person? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. We've always had, it's, it's interesting. One of the strengths of a, of a state voting system is the fact that New Jersey, there's 6,500 or 6,435, the number always goes up and down a little bit, unique voting precincts. And so all the numbers roll up from the smallest level. Each precinct has, I think our lowest have like 24. 
when we have some very small little communities, right? And right. our highest have 3,000 where we've got some very dense urban areas. But each of those is individual. What's happening now is counties are offering early voting. So Morris County may typically have 400 voting spots. During the seven, I think it's seven day early voting period, there's seven of them. And you can walk into any of those seven locations throughout the county from anywhere in the county and place your early vote. So they're kind of like moving us from 400 unique places to seven unique places or one unique place being your mail and everything to your local county if you vote by mail. Well, and then that means that when they walk into that, what would be, we call a voting center, I guess, um, then they get uh, a ballot that is printed specifically for them based on where they live. Uh, in, in my particular case, it's all digital. So when I walked in and I went to an early vote last year and I checked in and they know who they say, okay, you're in Madison, you're in uh, Madison community, you're in district 14, your ballot would look as such. And it shows up digitally unique to me. And oh, so, so you, you don't get a, it, it shows up on the screen. It shows up on the screen and I've pushed I it on the screen. I see. Okay. That's a whole different issue, but um, yeah, yeah, but, but, yeah. But certainly in Maricopa County in November, it was, they were printed, the the unique ballots were printed in these locations, these voting centers, and the printers were not properly calibrated. And it caused huge long lines and chaos, and then the tabulators weren't working. And so it was pretty much of a nightmare in Maricopa County, Arizona on Election Day. And we had a similar mere image almost in Mercer County, New Jersey on election day. Really? It stopped working because of a shift in the ballot, the paper ballot is again, I'm not going to say this correctly, but it was either too big or too small. And when they tried to run it through, it didn't work. And Mercer County, which has about ooh, a quarter of a million voters. Oh my word. Us on election day. Oh, my. So what have they done about that? Anything? <laughs> They're doing lots right now. And we're actually doing some interesting things with the data that are challenging some of the things they did. Oh, wow. Well, we have to talk about that. So we'll come back to that. OK, so now so you talked about um, the data that you get from the state and the county. So now you're, you've got the voter registration database. You get that once a month and you're coming up on two years and you get the voter histories. And so tell us what, um, walk us through, walk everybody through what you've learned and some of the things that you have, you and your cohorts have done to make things better in New Jersey. Well, thank you. Well, one of the first things we did is we realized how much we didn't understand because we saw this thing, we we were making assumptions or we think this happens, but we really didn't know. So we took our local county something we had had relationships with people there via email for years. And we called above and said, can we come visit you? We just want to make sure we understand the data we're looking at. And we put together about a five page, I call it just kind of a conversation. Like, can you explain what, what a status is? Can you explain how these numbers map to the numbers you present as a number of registered voters? Can you tell us about what happens when people join, when people just kind of a series of questions. And we showed them examples of the data that we didn't, we want to make sure we were interpreting correctly because we didn't understand it. So we kind of walked in saying, we're confused, please help. And we had a wonderful afternoon. We met really? With, that we met with the board of elections administrator and her chief analyst. I guess he's the guy who kind of generated the list for us. Mm-hmm. And we just sat down and talked. And they just showed us all the things that we didn't understand. And they were very helpful. And they sh- shared with us the challenges they faced because we were asking, why does this happen? Why is this happening? Oh, this happens because of that. So we didn't tell them or we didn't show them anything. They didn't know is the best way to explain it. And they also helped us understand the headaches they had, the challenge they had, and how hard they were trying to get everything right. So it was, it was a really wonderful conversation. We learned so much. And one of the things we asked them, we said, we think, and we're looking at the data, it looks like we've got 505 people that have two voter IDs. 
but we can't see everything. We can see name, we can see date of birth and an address and a name. Looks like the same person, but you know more. Can we send you that data? They go, absolutely. So we did, and then we tracked it. I had a wonderful boss for many years that had a great line. He said, inspect what you expect. Mm. And I always remember that because he was very good at it. <laughs> and I'd always be on my toes. So he taught me a lot. But what we did is we said, okay, we gave them that list of 500, actually 1,010 voter IDs. And then we tracked the next month's data set. And about half them were gone. We said, wow, maybe it's working. And we waited another month and tracked it again. And of the 505 names or 505 individuals, which looks like they had two, 503 of them were gone. Wow. Oh, that's a pretty good rate. That's and the two, the two that were left were actually, they turned out to be twin sisters who were both born in the 1930s. And their names were close enough, but enough difference. And again, they had data we didn't have. They could say, no, they're really two different people. But we thought that was a pretty good result. But we said, wow, it worked. Again, it was non-adversarial. It was, we're here to help. Are you interested in this information? Can we send it to you? And then if we send it to them, will they do anything? That's always the big thing. Will they do something? And they did. And so we learned from that. We kind of built a model of how to create, I called it a conversation document, three or four pages to send to a county and say, we'd like to talk to you about what we're seeing in the voter data. And we basically took a starting point and an ending point for a county, and we measured everything that changed. And when you do that over a two or three or four month time period, anomalies pop up. Like people that weren't there on January 1st, they were there on June 1st, but they have a registration date of five years ago. Where did they come from? Right. How did they get there? Or people that get moved from one county, and we actually found people that popped into a county or disappeared at a county, and they never moved. Their address got shifted. We've actually found people that were registered in two different counties at the exact same address, and neither county knew about the other one. And we shared it with both counties. They fixed it. So what we found is by kind of creating this standard conversation document that says, help us understand why this happens. And by the way, did you see these problems? And here's a list of people that kind of look like they might be duplicated or have multiple IDs, sending to the county and then following up. We have a lot of success. Same approaches. We're here to help. You know, we're kind of your, your you know, I was trying to say, I try to be annoying in a positive way. Because I try to let people know that I'm here to help, but I'm not going away. Right. And I try to present them with quality information so that it's worth their time. That's kind of how we've done it. You know, Dave, I think the thing that really got my attention the first time I heard you on, on our first working group call um, is that very thing, because um, I wrote the Citizen's Guide to Building an Election Integrity Infrastructure uh, a couple of years ago. And as someone who's been in and around election offices for many decades, more than I'd like to <laughs> admit, um, I, I, just, I just have always found that the best approach is to start by going in and doing exactly what you did. Go sit down and say, tell me, um, what is your list maintenance process? Tell us, tell me, uh, how do you do this? Uh, what information can we share with you um, that might be helpful to you? But to start that way, and I wrote that a couple of years ago because just based on my experience over many years, but one of the things that I... I know so many people all over this country who have spent hours and hours and hours gathering information, looking at data, canvassing, knocking doors, finding information, and then, and then taking that to an election office and just saying, here, look what we found, and being surprised that the election official is not totally thrilled that someone just brought them 30,000 names to be removed. And so, yeah, and then being very frustrated that things don't happen. But what you what you've described is a is realizing that there are people on the other end who have the job to do and you've made it I think what you said is you're helping them do their jobs. Better. You're using their data. Yeah. We, we, what I've what I've really learned is 
you know, we always have this, oh my God, they're, these are all terrible people who are trying to steal elections and they're sitting behind the scenes plotting against the world. No, they're not. They're just working as hard as they can with limited resources and with limited views of the data. And what I've learned from my dealings with them is they're so busy trying to get through today and to plan for the next election and get everything set up that they don't have the time to self-audit. They would like to, I think many of them, but they don't have the time, they don't have the tools, they don't have the staff because they're just trying to survive the next day. Never enough people, the technology, even so, oh, they've got a brand new system. Well, I got one email from one county recently that says, yeah, since our wonderful new system went live, it's done nothing. It doesn't match voters, new voters and changes the way it's supposed to. Oh my. It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So thank you for your list. You know, the one lady said, I actually pulled the data down and put it into an access database and try to sort through it myself. So oh, wow. here the state has got a multi has got a contract with a third party spending millions of dollars with. This third party doesn't really seem to be managing except, you know, keeping the lights on and keeping the data chugging away. But nobody seems to look at it and say, why do we have these issues or how do we fix them? So when I did, I started with that one county. We got really good at matching simple duplicates, date of birth, address and name, everything the same. And last summer, we contacted, we sent lists to eight counties. Some we knew, some we didn't know, right? Some were small, some were big. One county, I sent, I sent them a list of almost 4,000 names, right? Uh, they will remain nameless, right? <laughs> and I talked to the lady, I, she, she, goes, well, she goes, well, who are you, right? She goes, this, the, this Trenton's supposed to send us this kind of data. I go, well, okay. And she goes, well, who are you? I said, well, I'm just a guy. We got stuck in a wheelchair because of an accident. I got too much free time on my hands and I'm good in Excel. And it just looks like this. May I send you the list? She goes, sure. And so I had the least expectations after my conversation. I really didn't have any expectations at all, right? But I hope for the best. And of those 1,700 possible voters, the first month, 48 got cleaned up. I go, well, it's a start. You know, busy, yeah. right? The next month, a couple hundred got cleaned up. I go, well, that's not so bad. The third month, 900 got cleaned up. Wow. Said, wow. So as we neared the end of the year, that county cleaned up 91% of the names we gave them. So not a perfect, but what I've learned is one is it's a process like everything else. They got to fit it into their schedule. And we tracked those eight counties versus the rest of the state because we found duplicates everywhere. And we wanted to see one if the county we didn't talk to, if they did anything on their own. And if the counties we sent it to did something and three of the counties took it down to zero, cleaned every single one up. We gave them. It's like, that's pretty cool. That made a difference. This county got 91% cleaned up a pile. And there was another county that cleaned up five of the 300 we gave to them. And I'm guessing those five maybe just happened by mistake. They probably didn't mean to actually get them, but they did. So we found very different results between July 5th. I think I started sending about July 5th. And the end of last year. And while we were kind of waiting and measuring and counting and tracking, we did our programmers, we figured out ways to look beyond just simple matches. And we found ways to find nicknames and typos and name changes, divorces or marriages, because it was all keying off the address and the date of birth. We even found ways to kind of track somebody that may have moved from point A to point B in a county. And so while we were tracking and matching, we built a bigger list and we ended up with a list of over 8,000 voters across the state. And this time we decided to take a different approach. It's this time we hit all 21 counties in two days. And I basically, I personalized a very short email. Some of them I knew from my previous, I said, Hey, the folks, I said, nice job. 91% you clean it. Nice job. Knocking out those first 1700. Here's 3000 more. <laughs> <laughs> And then I tried to be nice, right? But, and I created a two page cover letter, became a PDF. And I said, hey, for the last six months, this is what we did. And these were the results, trying to establish a little bit of credibility that we seem to know what we're doing. Then I said, we've gotten more sophisticated with our matching. Here's the things we've been able to find. Here's an updated list. And 
every registrar in every one of New Jersey 21 counties got that on either two days, two weeks, two weeks, I think two weeks on Friday and the Monday. Because I looked up everybody, sent every single person a note. I've got some really notes back. I got a call from one county I had no, no connection with at all. And they said, may I call you? I said, absolutely. And I had a wonderful conversation with the registrar based on the email I sent. And she was like, thank you. You know, we try our best. I really worry about the integrity of our voter list. And your data was really helpful, which is really cool. Now, I got nothing from other counties, but that's okay. My plan is to wait 90 days mm-hmm. and to hit all 21 counties again with the results to either show, to acknowledge the successes of the counties. And maybe they all, maybe I exceed my expectations and they do. And all 21 counties clean up all 8,000 voters we gave them. That'd be cool. I'm not counting on it, but it's cool. But my point is I want to make the case that we're here to help, that we give you good quality data. And by the way, we're going to measure the results. Now, the next thing we're trying to figure out is how do we report on them? How yeah. do we kind of go beyond just the conversations with the local board of eds and kind of engage the larger population of New Jersey who may be interested in saying, hey, people are trying very hard, at least some of them, maybe all of them, maybe some of them. And here's what we found in our results, what we're working on to date as we work hard to improve the integrity. And we, we really want to get to the point, you know, people say, are you cleaning the voter rolls up? It's voter suppression. No, it's not. It's just ensuring the integrity of the roles. And the way I look, I have to try to figure out how to say this best. When I ran my business processes in Big Pharma, the government, the FDA, the Department of Justice could come at the drop of a hat and audit me. And their expectations is we got it right or if we weren't perfect, we had ways to catch where we made mistakes and correct them. And that was reasonable. You know, we're regulated business. We have to get it right. People are expecting us to. Why can't we expect the same of the government? Why do we have to allow our tax dollars and the people who work for us who manage a really critical bit of data about our state, who's a registered voter, why can't we hold them accountable the same way to get it right or to acknowledge that mistakes will be made, but we're here to help and here's how we present you the data back so you can do a better job on our behalf. That's kind of where I'm trying. I think that makes so much sense. But Dave, I want to go back to something. You say you're going to send a report. Yeah, if, see if I got this right, that you're going to basically go back to the 21 counties that you had uh, sent the information to all 21 counties. Here, Here's what we found uh, are some, we think, possible errors in your uh, data. Yeah. And, and, now you, and now you know who, which counties have done something about that and which haven't. And so you're going to send them all something saying, here are, we send each of you information and here are the, here's the percentage or here are the, here are the, here's what's happened since. Here's what happens basically. Here's the list I sent. And the email that I sent them included that chart that showed how all 21, the numbers for all 21, the 8,080, whatever, 8,008, whatever it was. The, the email I sent included the chart that showed what I was getting ready to send to each county individually. So I would take the exact same chart and say, this is what you all got in February. This is what you look like at the end of April. And just well, but, but if I'm in one county, will I get the complete statewide chart so that you can Everybody. basically put a little pressure on the counties that didn't do anything because they can, they can see that their counterparts in other counties actually took it seriously and did something about it. I figured, absolutely. Before, remember, I, I communicated to eight counties and I compared and contrasted them with the other 13. I did nothing, right? Right. And, but I just kind of watch and see, were people actually managing this independently or not? Now they all got the same communication with their set of data on the same two days. And now I'm going to measure how they all do. So I figured, same idea, a little friendly competition, but also to show some counties that other people take it seriously. And that's right. where I want to be able to communicate that to a broader audience. And I'm hopeful, again, if all 8,000 were gone, I say, wow, we actually made a difference. We'll find out again at the end of April. I give people 90 days because it's a process. Right. This is a good time of year to do it because the next election is not until June when we have, yeah, June when we have the primaries. 
because we're also building up to a statewide election next November. Oh, that's right. New well, Jersey has off-year elections. Other yeah. states um, elect everybody, and even numbered years, New Jersey is one of the, yeah. what, five states that has off-year elections. So. Every single state legislator is up for election this year. So the way I figure I can communicate with them and saying, hey, I'm helping make sure that you can count on the integrity of the voter list being used to elect you or not. And I don't know if they'll appreciate me or not, but we'll find out. Thanks, Jeff. Well, that's very interesting. Um, so would you, do you have any way to, I mean, you, you're a data guy, so I, I presume you know pretty close, uh, closely to estimate or know. Um, how many uh, registrations would you say, uh, duplicates or other faulty registrations, would you say have been uh, removed at, as a result of your uh, cl data cleaning efforts? Uh, we've gotten rid of about 3,000 in the last six months. Wow. Last. At the first set that we did from the counties we communicated to, as well as the other counties who are cleaning up their own. But I think about 3,000 disappeared during that time. About two thirds of the ones that we identified in June of last year were gone by January of this year. Really and amazing. That, and the, again, that one county took out over 1,700. So what do you think, what has been the state's reaction? Have you been in touch with the, with the state election office about any of this or uh, to? No. Advise about what you've been doing? No. No. Uh, my approach is I, no, I deal with the counties. The you counties the are the responsible. Every county as an individual, you can see it on the website. I am responsible for the integrity and the accuracy of my county's voter list. That's who got my email. That's who got my list. That's where the responsibility lies. The state is behind the scenes, owns the relationship with the third party vendor. And I don't know what else they do. So I don't see any point in communicating with them because I don't, I just don't see any point. So I don't. I wonder, uh, the, the third party vendor just uh, maintains whatever data that the state sends them and doesn't really do anything. Well, I, yeah. I, I, as far as I could tell, they host, administer, and maintain the central database. So whatever daily jobs are, they run them. Wherever security exists, they own it. Whatever requests for data, the data goes in and they present the results of that request as near, near as I can tell. What seems to be when I ask a county for data through an OPA request, they pretty much, I'm very explicit, give me very give me name, address, city, state, zip, municipality, ward. You know, I tell them exactly what I want. So that way they can't give me something wrong. Well, they do sometimes. But I ask them what I want. And I think they're just basically keying that into a template somewhere and either running a job or asking the vendor to run a job on their behalf. Um, how much do you have to pay the state for the co for a copy of the data list that you get once a no. month? No, there is that when when you ask for more detailed bits of information from a county, you know, I would like the ballot uh, images or something like that. Well, then they get well. That's good. Take so many man hours and so many dollars an hour to make photocopies for you, and that will cost you twenty seven thousand four hundred twelve dollars. But when you just ask for data, the OPA form says, what will you pay and what's your maximum amount? So you have to put something in there. So I always put a dollar. You have to put a number there. Uh, I've never paid a penny for any of the data I've asked for from the state of New Jersey. You know, that's really fabulous. Um, some states, some citizens in some states are not quite that fortunate. Virginia, for instance, charges $20,000 every time they get the list if you are not and I actually think it's probably a violation of the Constitution because if you're a political party or a candidate, you don't pay anything. But if you're a citizen uh, or a citizens group, you have to pay twenty thousand dollars, and you can't um, you can't publish it. Um, and that's kind of a problem in, in, for some people um, who are trying to Voter Reference Foundation, for instance, is trying to. Um, collect and publish the voter list for all the states. Although I wondered about how they, that's possible since the voter list changes daily. So I, I don't know how you do that. It, it's that. I mean, that's, and the reality is it does. People go, well, how can it change every day? I go, well, people does. die. Yeah, people people die. We, we actually, every 30 days, we get an update. And I run a couple jobs and I say, what changed? Show me the new registrations over the last 30 days. How many are brand new and how many you get a new registration number when you move to a new county in New Jersey. If I move across the street in my town, 
nothing changes because I just have a new address. But if I move five miles into a new county, I get a new registration date in that new county. And I can actually track. What I do is I say, show me everybody with a new registration, right? In the last 30 days. And I say, show me where they were 30 days ago. And either they didn't exist because they're a brand new voter or it shows me the old county. I can actually watch the flow of population across New Jersey. It's fascinating. As, mm-hmm. a, as a rule, we don't move far. <laughs> the people at the shore tend to stay at the shore. <laughs> the people in the cities tend to stay in the cities and the urban counties. But it's, it's, it's just fascinating to kind of watch the flow. But then I know in a given month what percentage are brand new voters and what percentages are just reloads. So New Jersey has 15,000, if I get this right, 15,000 more voters today at the end of January than it did in March of 2021. You know, that's not very much of a change, right? Well, behind or below that number is over half a million new registrations, right? And over 350,000 departures. So a small change hides massive changes, really, when it comes down to it. It's because you have a constant stream of people arriving and people departing in the system. And you also get the base. Why? why how can I have 15,000 with? 550 plus and 350 minus because you have all these new registrations that are just people moving throughout the state. So uh, at first I looked up, my math is wrong. How can my math be so wrong? And I looked, I said, oh, because roughly 30% of these new registrations are just people moving from county to county. So it may look like a new registration, but it's not a new voter, if that makes sense. Well, how do you, uh, so are the when you talk about the voter ID number, yeah. that is that that's a number that's assigned by the county when someone registers. Is that right? I don't know who I don't know who creates it. If it's, a, I'm guessing probably not the county because they're unique at the state. So I'm I guessing the, the county when they register somebody has a uh, inventory or has an access that says this voter new voter gets this voter ID from some central location. Otherwise, you potentially have dupes. But so that there's a stack of unique voter ID, and those all changed in 2020. Is before the 2020 election, New Jersey dumped their old voter ID numbers from the past and created brand new voter ID numbers for every single person. That I seems like I a night. That seems like a nightmare. Yeah, well, I remember when I got the file. I went, huh? What? <laughs> I've got nine years of history with the old voter ID number. Where did this come from? And I called oh, the guy my- in the county. I said, Hey. What happened? He goes, oh, yeah, they told us all new voter ID numbers. And it's now an alphanumeric. And it's just, it, there's, we don't know where it came from. We don't know why it was done. And the county, when we asked them these questions, they didn't really know either. It was just, this is just what's going to happen. Now, now it's up there and running. You know, we're very used to it. But it was a fairly significant change all in one fell swoop back in 2020 before the election. Okay. So when, when someone moves from one county to another county, how does the state how how do, how does how does that voter ID number travel with them? Uh, it, well, it they basically it just they they just get a new address, so the voter ID number stays the same mostly. Now there are thousands of people that when they move they get a new voter ID number in County B, and their old voter ID number is still active in County A. That's kind of part B of what I want to get. First, I gave people who moved in the county. That's the list I created. The mm-hmm. next thing I'm going to go after is the people that exist in multiple places in the state with two IDs. For the most part, now it's, again, thousands of people every month move across county lines and are re-registered successfully. But of those thousands, hundreds of them get a new ID. And that's the next thing we want to kind of go after. And, and what we've learned, in actually, I got a really nice note recently from one of the registrars. So said, Dave, thank you so much. You found things I couldn't find. I tried to find them. Thank you. You're obviously better at it, or you've got more time, or maybe more time, whatever. But she was very appreciative. And she goes, You know, ever since, and she says in 2019, there was a change in New Jersey where at motor vehicle, you had to opt in to have your motor vehicle transaction then become a fee to the voter and become a registered voter. So you had to physically say, Yes, I would like to register as a voter when I get my driver's license. In, 19, in 2019, 
you had to opt out, which means oh, if you wow. didn't say no, that your data would flow. And she told me that the volume of data hitting every local board of election has quadrupled in that time. And the system is not doing a good job helping them match them to existing records. And when, when she sent me that, I said, well, let me try something. And from the big voter ID file I have of all the duplicates, I graphed, when was the duplicate created? And in 2019, it exploded mm-hmm. from tens to the thousands. So basically, somebody got a smart, brilliant idea, and they don't have a tool and a system to manage it, which is generating all this nonsense in New Jersey. And it's but, again, the DMV. But do, do, do you know what, uh, why that change was made? I, I don't know. I just found out about it, and I haven't gone back to look. But somewhere, there's a bit of legislator, probably well-meaning in nature, that made this change, as all the legislation is so well-meaning, and one of those unintended consequences, so to speak. So, Or I'm, let me just say, yeah. it might have been an intended consequence, because <laughs> there is a big push among some people to have automatic voter registration, where people don't even who don't even want to be registered or may not even be eligible to be registered where if they have any interaction with the government they get registered automatically which is i think that is a data analyst nightmare and what i hope to do here as kind of part b when i send the update 90 days is i think i want to try to somehow weave this feedback into it to say thanks to those of you who I spoke to and who sent me emails about some of the root causes of the challenge you face and to include this chart that I created that shows how it exploded and how this system they've been given or this process been created is not working. And what can we do? What can I do as a citizen to use data? I used to drive my staff crazy at work is I was very, I would say facts are my friends. It wasn't my opinion. It wasn't my beliefs. It was reality. And so whenever I show up, remember my staff's desk, they're like, oh, here comes the boss. And I always be like, help me understand this. And they go, you got millions of bloody transactions. How did you find that? I said, because I'm good at spotting things that don't make sense is I can run through huge reams of data in my, my, my professional life for years and find the things that just stood out, didn't make sense. It's kind of that I have an accounting undergraduate degree and I spent a little time as an auditor and actually in a casino hotel in my early days of my career, (laughs) looking for things in kitchens and in data that didn't make sense. And it's something I've just figured out and have, I don't know if it's a talent or a skill for, is running through massive data sets and going, huh, why is that happening? And so I hope to be able to use what I'm doing right now to cast the light on this now that I've got more data about it, on how something has been created, which is making things worse, which is destroying the integrity of a very critical resource to the state of New Jersey, our voter rolls. So Dave, I think one thing I would be curious about is to know whether that was a statutory change or just an administrative directive from someone. So when you find that out, let me know. I'll let you know, I'll keep you informed. That, the person, that, that the person, the person to who told me, I'm going to actually, I'm going to follow up with the person I heard from and say, hey, now this chart makes sense and help me understand more about it. Maybe there's something. Yeah, where I that came from. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, talk to everybody for a moment about the people who with whom you work, because you say you have programmers. I mean, yeah. these are all people who are volunteers. Yeah. Just yeah. With, there's, there's, there's been a quorum, about seven, with another five or six, seven people have kind of come on and gone at different points over the last couple of years, but the core group has stuck together. Uh, they, uh, they're members, they've been local board of ed members. They're local council, uh, local uh, committee people, you know, on the, on the county committee members in their community. They're people who have been in their communities who have been active for many, many years in many different roles. And they've just over whatever, whatever, however it's happened, they've come to focus on the integrity of the voter data. Maybe they lost an election or they watched something was going on. They say, wait a second. And they've now applied. They're mostly older retired folks. You know, I kind of got retired by an accident, which left me in a wheelchair. 
and they all have extra time on their hands. And they said, what can I do to make a difference? How can I contribute to what's going on? And so we've got people that are, I have one gentleman who's our database expert and he's running our server and making sure the data flows in there. And whenever we have a more complicated, hey, how can we do this? He comes up with, like I said, I want to know everybody that was in last month's data feed who's gone this month. How can I do that? And he'll write me an SQL query that shows me exactly how to do it. Something beyond my capabilities, but he can do it a piece of cake. And then I run it every month and do the results. So we've got folks, data programmers. We have a husband and wife that I guess they've just been community activists for their whole lives. They have their nose in every aspect of things that are not working well and not going on. So we are one of many uh, irons they have in the fire, for lack of a better lead. And they kind of keep us coordinated, organized, make sure we all show up every week to talk and fight with each other on a regular basis. And they keep kind of, they're not database analysts by any means, but they have connections into legislators. They have mm. connections to local county people across the whole state. And they're able to mobilize a lot of volunteers to do things. Uh, so we just have a really mixed bag of people. I'm more the analyst and trying to look at it and say, this doesn't make sense and trying to uh, capture it and paint a picture with it. Kind of like what I tried to do earlier this week on your, uh, on your Zoomcast is I try to be able to tell, let data help me tell a story about mm -hmm. what I'm finding. So it's just a really mixed bag of people, all the volunteers. Again, we fight with each other regularly, uh, but we all kind of say, what can we do better? You know, we had a teleconference yesterday, right? And we were talking about one specific thing. And somebody goes, did you think about that? It's like, well, that's a really cool idea. I never thought about that at all. And so last night after the conference, I recut a data set to what she suggested. And I had it out to everybody before I went to bed last night, looking at a data set and a problem we were trying to solve from a very different perspective. So that's what's really exciting about it also is we look at things very differently. And between the group, we're able to come up and say, well, that doesn't make sense. How do we approach this? And then we go back and we kind of operate you know, independently in many respects. But once a week, we all get on a Zoom conference and discuss, debate, fight, support, and come up with new ways of looking at the data and figure out how to move forward. Does that make sense? It does. And, you know, I could actually spend hours and hours uh, asking you questions uh, about all this, even though I'm not a data person, I'm not a technology person, but I just have so much admiration for what you're doing and what you built. And and I hope you'll pass along um, my congratulations to your colleagues. I mean, it's just really pretty phenomenal. What I would say is uh, what you all have in common is you're great patriots uh, and you want to make the system better. And that's really what the Election Integrity Network and what all of us are working in this want to do is we, we just want to preserve the integrity of our elections so that whoever wins the election, that people can be confident that the process was fair. That's really, all, that's really all we care about. That's what that, we care about. That's the way I look at it. My list of Republicans, Democrats, independents, Greens, socialists, libertarians, your party is irrelevant. If there's a duplicate record, there's a duplicate record. And we pass it on. And again, same idea. It doesn't matter. All that matters is can we improve the integrity of the list of people who make a difference by their vote in our state? That's all. Because we want all of those people on the list to have confidence that the data is accurate and secure and that people are not getting ballots who uh, shouldn't be getting ballots and um, that every legal vote is counted, but that we're not including um, illegal votes from people who uh, really aren't eligible to vote. So my hat is off to you, Dave. You've done a wonderful Thanks. job. Really appreciate it. It's such a, so great to meet you uh, virtually and uh, hope to be working with you for a long time to come. So thank you for all you do. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care. Thank you. And that uh, concludes our episode this week uh, of Who's Counting. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode. We hope you'll share the episode, we hope that you'll subscribe to the podcast because that's how we share the news about what people around America are doing to help save our elections. And with that, uh, we do thank you for joining us and we hope to see you next week. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you for joining Who's Counting with Cleta Mitchell, the podcast about America's elections. 
Please help us fight big tech censorship. Like and subscribe to this podcast and be sure to share it with your friends. You can become part of this election integrity movement by signing up to join the Election Integrity Network. Go to whoscounting.us. The Who's Counting podcast is produced by the Election Integrity Network.